really excited about this Bantamweight debut for the Philippines. We have Mark Mugen Striegel, Matt. We were really anticipating his UFC debut. The video is out there. You can check it back in the Fight Name Picks catalog. We're supposed to be taking on Timor Valiev. And excited for a lot of different reasons. I mean, for Mark Striegel, out of his 18 total wins, 14 of them by submission. This guy's a Sambo expert. He's meddled in some of the events uh, in the South Asian market. And a guy that you can get really excited about because he's faced really good competition on the regional scene. It's not often you see a fighter with this kind of record just kind of jumping into the UFC. There is one fighter that we have seen recently in Czech Republic's David Dvorak, but it, that doesn't happen very often. So for Mark Striegel, all of those submission wins. He has a submission win from about uh, four or five years ago over Kai Kara France on the regional scene. He also has a no contest uh, on his record against former UFC talent Sunichi Shimizu in his last fight. It was a low blow. The fight got called off. That's the one no contest. So for Mark Striegel, you know what you're going to get basically in terms of grappling. And if you go back and watch some of his fights, really, really sneaky takedowns. And once he's on top, he can really control a lot of his opponents. I will say you don't often see a lot of 32-year-olds making their uh, UFC debuts maybe sure. this late in their careers. And the reason why that fight against Timur Valia fell out, Striegel tested positive to COVID-19. So a little bit of a delay into his UFC debut. Now, maybe he could have got the win over Timur Valia. Sure. He was a pretty big underdog in that one going into it. He's also a huge underdog coming into this one, which is a bit of a head-scratcher, taking on Russia's Syed Nurmagomedov and Matt from what we've seen from Nurmagomedov, split decision win over Justin Scoggins. Then he knocks Ricardo Hamos' head completely off. And then he has a loss to Howney Barcelos. And I mean, Howney, big fan. Wish we get to see him fight a lot more. Former uh, LFA, RFA champ before he came into the UFC. And a really tidy record on his part. But Syed Nurmagomedov definitely didn't have his best day that time out. So... It's been a little while since we've seen Syed Nurmagomedov, about nine months. For Mark Striegel, we haven't seen him in almost a year and a half since that no contest. So it's a little bit of a tale of the unknowns, but the thing that kind of, I wouldn't say rubs me the wrong way, but it's the fact that Syed Nurmagomedov, in his first few fights, in the Scoggins fight, he was a slight favorite. In the Hamos fight, again, we're talking, you know, plus 160 in around there, something like that. And in the Barcellos fight, around there. So we're hovering around par, a little bit above, a little bit below. Sired Nurmagomedov is a more than 4-1 to one favorite in this fight. It's a, a total head-scratcher. I know everybody sees this fight for Nurmagomedov, but it is a pass from me. Matt, it should be an interesting fight. I think it's more... Uh, competitive than some of the numbers might show you. What do you think about this? One? Uh, well, it definitely is more competitive than a four to one favor for Nurmagomedov Medov because Nurmagomedov Medov hasn't given us a reason to really give him those odds. Because you got to think the uh, uh, Ricardo Hamos fight. I was really excited for that fight going into it because Nurmagomedov Medov coming out of the Scoggins win. Yes, it was a win, but it is hard to look good against a guy like Justin Scoggins. He moves around so much; he's really wonky. So, okay, a split decision win over him, not the end of the world. But Hamos, I think everyone kind of realizes he's good on the feet. He's good on the ground. He's a legit talent at 135. And for Nurmagomedov Medov to go out there and kind of beat him with his own techniques, throw what Nick Diaz affectionately calls spinning shit, and hits him with that spinning back kick to the body. It was really the beginning of the end from there. And Nurmagomedov, Medov, the nice thing is his footwork too. He's good at jumping in. He kind of has not really a blitz style like a Wonder Boy Thompson, but he will kind of blitz in, throw his combination, then jump out really quick. And you like that too because defensively he is quite sound. This fight's going to be interesting. Because there's so many unknowns around Mark Striegel, really. Because his Samba, will he be able to take down Said Nurmagomedov? And that's not the only question. Will he be able to hold him down? Because Nurmagomedov's good in that initial scramble, but if you are a big, strong enough grappler, you can kind of hold him down. So if Striegel is able to start initiating some of his wrestling, I do think he can have some success, even though he is up like plus 360, which is wild to me. But it's a good fight, I do think, for Striegel for his UFC debut. Nurmagomedov, he's been out for a little bit. And... Again, we don't really know where his ceiling's at right now, so Strick can come in as a massive underdog, pick up a win. I mean, it, not that it puts a rocket to his back, but it's going to shoot him up those rankings quite a bit and really get his name out there in the public. And we've seen pure grapplers come in. They're underdogs. We picked them. This has happened twice, and it's actually been a women's bantamweight recently with Stephanie Egger and Sarah Alpar, where we were going off with pure grappling acumen. With Alpar, it was a wrestling. With Egger, it was the judo. With Striegel, it's the sambo. So if we go out there and pick Striegel, I know a lot of people are going to hate on the pick, but 
I could see somebody picking Mark Striegel. Now, we look at the Tapology picks so far. So to 705 total uh, predictions on Tapology, 89% going with Nurmagomedov, 76% saying he's going to win by decision. If you look at the odds again, Sayer Nurmagomedov open a minus 365 favorite. He's now a minus 428 average. And for Mark Striegel, he opened at a plus 300. He's now a plus 323. So it's really surprising to me, based off of what we've seen from Mark Striegel, taking on decent regional competition. Yeah, he's lost two fights, but he's also won 18 of them. And it hasn't been against terrible competition. I mean, one of the losses was to Reese McLaren. And if you've seen him competing with one championship, they're not just giving him the easy fights. Like, Reese McLaren's a pretty good fighter. So to lose to a guy like that, I'm fine with it. Am I going to side with Syed Nurmagomedov? I do like him. I mean, he is quite well-rounded. I do worry about maybe some periods of inactivity. And if he's getting taken down and held down, oh boy, I'm worrying. So for me, overall, this is a pass. I'll take Syed Nurmagomedov, but there's a lot of upside in Mark Striegel. I really can't add much more to that analysis. I am going to pick Nurmagomedov. Just, I like the versatility of his game because if Striegel can't get the takedowns, I think it's safe to assume Nurmagomedov can win the exchanges on the feet. So it really comes down to, can Mark Striegel take and hold Syed Nurmagomedov down? I think he will have success throughout the fight. I just don't really see the control element from him in this one, so I'm also going to pick Nurmagomedov in this. Matt, really looking forward to this fight. We've got a great main event between Chan Sung Jung, the Korean Zombie taking on Brian T. City Ortega. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, Matt. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Very interesting fight at light heavyweight as we have Russia's Gedshimarad Antigulov taking on Russia's Maxim Maximus Grecian. And I'm excited about this okay. one because we didn't get to see 100% Maxim Grecian in his last time out, in his UFC debut. And I'll explain why. You can see it up on the screen. Whenever I put the asterisk next to a weight, it's because they're either moving weight classes or they fought totally out of their weight class. And for Maxim Grecian, took his UFC debut on short notice, weighed in at 226 to take on Marcin Tabora. And Matt, I can talk about a couple of recent fighters where we did see Chris Dawkins cut quite a bit of weight, weigh in at 227 for his fight against Rodrigo Nascimento, and look amazing. That one was on purpose. For Maxim Grecian, though, coming in on short notice, you're typically a light heavyweight, and you're fighting Marcin Tabora that weighs at the top of the scales just about every time out. It's tough to game plan for it a guy is. like that. And now we saw Maxim Grecian on the regional scene, and I say regional scene, but all the way up through in Russia, but as well with the PFL, where he had a ton of success with his striking. You saw it against Jordan Johnson, who's as credentialed a wrestler as you're going to get at 185 and 205. He took the O from Jordan Johnson, who was, I wouldn't say ostentatious enough, but he had enough belief in himself that he could go to the PFL, make quite a bit of money. He went over there, loses to Grecian in their second fight. It was a draw. Max Grecian, what we've seen so far from him is the fact that distance striking, he's very, very good at it. Throws a nice leg kick, and he's the type of guy that we talk about leg kicks, but they're not all created equal. He can target your calf. He can target your knee. He can target your thigh. He does a very good job of that. I really like the striking out of Maxim Grecian. It was one of the things I remember highlighting in the Tabora preview. For Gad Shimarad and Tegulov, this guy so far in his UFC career, the average fight time is 2 minutes and 9 seconds. He's either finishing you or getting finished. And in his last three fights, he has been finished. And he hasn't looked good whatsoever. Now, we talk about the level of competition we're talking Iwan Kutselabi gets finished, Michael Olasheychuk, and then Paul Craig. And Matt, that Paul Craig was was a bad fight. Now, the division, you can say it's getting more and more stacked. It's tough to say it in a fight like this because Antegulov, exactly. unranked, 33 years old, Grecian, 36. If you're going to climb the ladder, here's your chance. Paul Craig, at this juncture, is rated 15th in the division. That's bad. Yeah, that's not good at all, really. So, Antikulov was kind of an interesting case, because when you do go back those two years and three months ago, he was a ranked heavy, or he was a ranked light heavyweight, I should say. And not that there was a lot of hype behind him, because he was kind of one of those guys who, one week you check the rankings, he was number 15, the next week you check the rankings, it'd be someone else. But he did have a number next to his name for at least some point in time. And that cute lava fight... It, it felt like a crossroads fight, especially looking back at it now, because Kutalaba came in dressed like Bret Hart. He had the music. He was going out in Calgary. He was going to do it. And the story of that fight was, can Antikulov make Kutalaba tired enough to then grapple him? And that fight took such a 180 because Kutalaba somehow just defended enough takedowns to make Antigulov tired, and then he TKO'd him. No big deal. You got knocked out by the Hulk. That's going to happen. So then you fight Olajechuk. Get knocked out by him. Not the best look, but again, we're dealing with two of the better strikers in the division, so you can go on a two-fight losing streak against those guys. 
The Paul Craig loss, if you're a grappler, you can't lose by first round submission to Paul Craig. Playing Paul Craig's game, because we all know what he's going to do. He's going to pull guard, and he's going to try to submit you off of his back. I'm not talking bad about his game plan, because it's pretty cool to watch when it actually comes to fruition, but... If you're in the UFC, you should know, and if especially if you're a grappler, you should be well aware of what Paul Craig's about to do. And for Antigulov to just basically get submitted and not put out much of a fight, I was really down on him after that performance. And I thought that was probably going to be it for him in the UFC, but now they're giving him Max Grecian coming down from heavyweight. And this is probably going to be it for him in the UFC. Grecian's a massive favorite, and justifiably so. And I don't even think it's because Max and Grecian's looked amazing in the UFC. I think it's more that Antigulov's looked... And it's hard to say he's looked old because he is only 33, but you can tell that the miles are starting to get to him. His movement's a little bit more labored. He doesn't have that explosiveness behind his takedowns because earlier on in the UFC when he was fighting, you know, the Joaquin Christiansons of the world. Former common opponent. Yes, former common opponent. He was able to, you know, really start to dominate using his physicality, but that somewhat left him. He reminds me of Dwayne Wade when he kind of started to go out of his prime a little early because, like, LeBron's still winning titles now, but Wade, by the time he was, like, 31, his knees started to go, and that's kind of where Antigulov is. He just seems like he's older than his age physically, and I do think that's going to catch up to him in this fight. I think if he can't get the takedown, and if he just gets fatigued in the first round like we have seen him do as of late, Grecian, like you would mention, he can pick him apart from distance. Even if he decided to go for the takedown, I don't think he will because Antigula's best uh, way to win, of course, is through grappling. But Grecian on the outside, especially with a tired opponent in front of him, should be able to kind of tee off on him. Yeah, it's kind of like if you put up Brandon Roy against Jamal Crawford in 2020, what's going to happen? Wow. Oh boy. Now, if we look at the total picks over on topology bit of a surprise to me it is out of 675 total votes 85 percent going with grecian and 71 percent saying he's going to win by knockout if you look at the odds now matt you alluded to this grecian open a minus 200 favorite he's now minus 383 average over on best fight odds and take open plus 170 he's now a plus 295 I do find that a bit of a surprise, just seeing where Antigulov, yes, he's been finished in his last three fights. He was finishing opponents before that. Grecian hasn't had a ton of experience, obviously, in the UFC, but if you have had the opportunity to watch the fights on the regional scene, and I know I talked about it, but the PFLs and so on and so forth back in Russia, he definitely has taken oh. on some good competition. I mean, we talked about it. His pro debut was against Baga Agaev, a guy that we certainly know from that scene. Shane Del Rosario was an early fight about 11 years ago, a guy that ended up in the UFC as well. Joachim Christensen, a win from back in 2012, and so on and so forth. I mean, his only, you know, big loss as of recently, yes, he lost that fight to Tabora, but that's somewhat understandable. Uh, he did get finished by Magomed Ankalaev with Akhmat Fight Show back in 2016. But again, we've seen what Ankalaev can do in the UFC. So for me to say... We've seen what Paul Craig can do to Ankalaev if, in if, the UFC. If Maxime Grecian can, you know, withstand the takedowns from Marcin Tabora, at least kind of keep him at bay somewhat. I know that fight wasn't overly competitive. One of the judges scored at 30-26 for Tabora. But still, we've seen what Grecian could do against Jordan Johnson, Rakeem Cleveland, so on and so forth. And Tegulov's too much of a question mark here. Definitely would still consider it a pass just based on the odds, but I will go with Maxim Grecian here. I agree 100%. Grecian's fought guys who can grapple, or guys who at least have somewhat similar styles to Antigulov. And the only issue is Antigulov's cardio probably isn't as good as those other guys. So I think if you can get past sort of that, what, two-minute, nine-second threshold of Antigulov, <laughs> then it should be smooth sailing for Grecian as the fight goes on. Matt, both of us going with Maxim Grecian in his second time out. You're not going to want to miss the rest of our full card previews, including an extended look at our main event between the Korean Zombie and Brian Ortega T-City. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, Matt, as we always say. Let's get into it looking forward to this lightweight contest between a couple of guys looking to capitalize off of their first fights in the UFC and I say capitalize because it didn't go well for Jamie Mullerkey it went well I mean he earned a bonus and for Francis Farris Ziam I mean definitely didn't go his way against Don Madge he was stepping in on short notice for Megamed Mustafayev who was originally supposed to be taking on Madge and I mean in that fight you had the French kickboxer coming in really trying to capitalize on what he's very good at and if you've watched any Farris Ziam fight tape from the regional scene or from that one contest in the UFC throws a really nice leg kick and I know that's a point of emphasis for the guys on the desk in the UFC but in every single okay. MMA organization that seems to be a really key point that they like to drive home it's the new hot uh, hot toy or hot thing on the market right now that everybody's starting to employ and for Farah Ziam I mean this guy former European K1 champ and you see it in his fights the way that he keeps his head nice and back he throws a nice whipping leg kick, but the also or the other thing that he does very well 
is the fact that he will check a leg kick, which you like to see. And I mean, you've got that pure kickboxing out of Farasim. You can see where he's trying to get more and more well-rounded as his fights have gone on. I know he does have submission finishes on his resume, but you saw it in the fight against Don Madge. When things got tight, he had his back up against the cage. He could get out of some of those bad positions. I mean, I'm not talking about a really exciting fight that he had against Don Madge. If you want to go back and watch it, so be it. Or you can take my word for it. It wasn't really the best fight. It sucks that we don't get to see more of Don Madge. And it was great that we got to see South Africa's Drikas Duplessis taking care of business in his UFC debut. But in terms of Farasim, I mean, he comes out of a good gym. We're talking about Bulgarian top team. You might scratch your head, but Morgan Charrier that uh, we've seen with Cage Warriors uh, challenge for a belt there. Another young guy in some of the lower weight classes. Carl Amasu as well that you've seen with Bellator. I mean, he, he did have a fight against Ben Askren, kind of leading the charge there. And for Jamie Mullerkey coming out of Australia, this is a guy that you look at his, his pro record and his early pro record, knockout loss to Alexander Volkanovsky. So you kind of shake your head. What are you going to get out of this guy? Trains out of Central Coast M. MMA in New South Wales, Australia, with a guy that you might not think he trained with. Matt, I think that Ross Pearson leading the charge at Central Coast, that's a pretty good gym to be training at anyway. You might not see a lot of UFC talent there, but for a guy like Jamie Mullerkey, it kind of shows in his game. Exactly, and a lot of people do forget, Ross Pearson was a coach on the Ultimate Fighter, and that was the thing that kind of made him realize, hey, I'm pretty good at this whole coaching thing. And yes, he coached a little bit before, but you got to think the amount of experience that a guy like Ross Pearson has that he can give to a fighter like Jamie Malarkey in the same division that he competed in, just a wealth of knowledge, and a guy who could kind of do a little bit of everything, which is really what you want from a coach. I mean, we go on about guys like Faraz Sahabi, who, yes, they can not only tell you what they want you to do, but they can actually get in there and kind of show you the techniques themselves. And I think Ross Pearson's a really important guy for that. Jimmy Malarkey and Faris Zium had very different first fights in the UFC because we were kind of talking about the Don Madge fight. And it's it's not a good one, let's be honest. Jimmy Malarkey fought Brad Riddell in his first fight, though, at Marvel Stadium. And that fight was an absolute slobber knocker. And it was a fight of the night, like you had mentioned, earned them both some bonus money. And it was really interesting, too, because Jimmy Malarkey going into that fight, you assumed, okay, he's going to try to take Brad Riddell down. And at least at the start of the fight, he did. But then he started getting hit to the body, and his gas tank did kind of slow as the fight went on, and Riddell was able to kind of, you know, he was able to strengthen as the fight was going on. The weird thing is, it's really hard to go from Brad Riddell to fighting Ferris Zium, because I don't really want to say it's a huge step down, because we don't really know where he is yet in the UFC, but Jimmy Malarkey has the experience. I'd say his grappling is probably better, just due to the fact that Malarkey, we saw in his first fight, he struck with Brad Riddell, and the whole time, they're saying, oh, just wait till he gets to the ground. He's so good. Uh, he's a submission artist, submission specialist, and he does have pretty good takedowns. The only problem with Jimmy Malarkey is that he does kind of pay for it if he doesn't get the takedown. We saw that in the Riddell fight where Riddell will be able to stuff his takedown and really make him pay for it time after time after time. So it will be interesting to see what the adjustments he's made coming into this one because if Malarkey does go out there and just try to throw caution to the wind like he did in his first fight, I don't think that's the smartest way to go. But if he did, if he does fight like he did at the start of that Riddell fight, really try to mix in his takedowns with his clinch work, with his striking. And if he can make this, you know, the ultimate MMA fight, not just make this kickboxers fight, Jimmy Malarkey, I do think, has a fairly bright future. I was surprised, too, in watching that fight. And again, it was on short notice. You had Don Madge getting ready for Magomed Mustafaya. That's very well-rounded, but you know him mostly for striking. So far as Zim went in there... And tried to clinch up, and he tried and clinch up in the middle of the cage. That's not something you typically no. see, especially out of a kickboxer. Now, we did see it on the regional scene in some of his fights. Uh, there is there is a lot of tape out there that you don't have to look too hard for. But the Julio Matos fight, that was one where you saw Ferris Zim having a lot of success with his striking. Then you go out and you watch his next fight against Yassin Belhaj. And that was a fight where, again... Matt, we kind of focused on it. We saw the submission finish. It was kind of sloppy. It wasn't the highest level jiu-jitsu, but overall a good win for him. His takedowns are pretty basic. He'll he'll shoot in for the doubles. He'll kind of go for the body lock and try and trip you and get you down. So it's not really the best, the highest of levels. Whereas Jamie Mullerkey, you look at that competition. I mean, he got knocked out in the Volkanovski fight. Then he got knocked out again. Kind of strange there. For Zim, he did take on decent names uh, on his way up, and he's a really young prospect. You can see it on the screen, 23 years old. But a win over Damian Lapolis four years ago, when the kid's 19, that's really telling. I mean, the Lapolis bro brothers are no joke. The win over Abner Lavaris as well, that's another big one. You've seen him fight some decent names over his, uh, his entire career. Maybe they weren't all wins. The other thing here, too, that I want to focus on, you've got 6'1", 75-inch reach for Zim, and for Mullerke, 6 feet, 72 uh, or 74-inch reach. 
you don't see a lot of lightweights you that don't. big. I mean, maybe these are guys that later on in their career, maybe you'll see them move up uh, to 170. You could almost like them, especially for Zim's frame. You look at him and you go, James Vick's a guy that's if you really split a little like bit. That. You kind of see James Vick. It, he does fight. The one thing I don't like about Zim is he does just kind of pull back with his head. He's used to being the taller guy, and not saying that this is the fight that's going to cost him, but we do see guys when they do have those holes in their defense. When they first get into the UFC, yes, they can move their way up the rankings, but as they start to fight the higher level guys, you've got to pick up out the holes in it. They will start to get caught. But that is the one thing that worries me about Zim. He pulls his head back, kind of like Luke Rockhold, and eventually you're going to get caught doing that. But I don't think in this fight this will be the one to catch them because Jimmy Malarkey probably going to be more of a wrestling heavy attack he can strike if he has to and if he can't get the takedowns but honestly i'm really excited for this being the first fight on the prelims yeah i'm really excited about it too the thing that really surprised me so if we look over on topology at the total votes at a 623 votes 78 percent going with australia's jamie muller key 72 percent saying he's going to win by decision this has actually been the biggest swing in the odds so far. Jamie Muller, key opened a plus 200 favorite. That line dropped quick, and it's continued to drop. He's now a minus 132, according to best fight odds. If we look at ZM, open minus 235. He's now a plus 107 underdog. And I find that surprising that that's the spread that you had to start, because going back and watching the fight tape... Again, Jamie Muller key, you worry about it. He gets knocked out by Volkanovski, and then he gets knocked out by a guy with a negative record who was 5, 6, and 1 at the time. Since then, put on a nice win streak, made it into the UFC, and then the loss to a really tough out in Brad Riddell. All right, stuff like that's going to happen. That seemed like a huge jump up in competition from what he'd been facing. Both of these guys, I should note too, out of Jamie Muller key's 12 wins, one of them by decision, the rest by finish. Same thing goes for Farasiem. Nine total finishes. And again, the one decision win. So these guys are finishers. I just see more attributes that I like out of a complex, complete mixed martial artist in Jamie Mullerkey than I've seen from Farasiem. I think he's just a little bit too green. I do like the wins. I do like the finishes. I just think it's a little bit too early for him. This is a good test. He could certainly get the win. But I do like Jamie Mullerkey in this one. I, I agree. If you can beat a guy like Mullerkey, then you... You do. You prove that you deserve to be there. Sorry, words are difficult. But for Zim, I would like to see him not get more experience on the regional scene. But if we could even see him on like a contender series, fight one of those guys, yeah, be one of the headlines, like yeah, yeah. kind of build him up a little bit more than the UFC has. He's still in the 23 and has a really bright future. But I just think Jimmy Malarkey, he's fought higher level competition on the regional scene. He's got more experience. And the fact that he can just do a little bit of everything should be able to get him by in this one. Matt, I'm really looking forward to this fight. We oh, both man. have Jamie Malarkey to get the win. It's a great card. You're not going to want to miss our extended look at our main event the korean zombie chan sung jung taking on t-city brian man. ortega matt as we always say with fight night picks keep it locked in and let's, let's get into it really interesting fight on our prelims of a card headlined by the korean zombie taking on brian t-city ortega we have the iron turtle jun young park taking on the welsh wrecking machine john phillips and if you look up john phillips topology page it lists him as the white mike tyson but he is anything but that unless he's mike tyson in 2005 because he's one and four in his total ufc tenure and three of those four losses have been by finish it hasn't gone all that well. The Alan Amadovsky win was certainly a surprise. I mean, he was on a three-fight losing streak at the time and knocked him out with a single blow, an overhand left early on. This guy from the Southpaw stance, he hits really hard. He's one of those guys that really came up through the cage warrior scene. That's where you got familiar with him. I know uh, coming into the UFC, it wasn't a cage warriors fight. And he had some experience with Bama, but it was mainly cage warriors, a fight against Frank Trigg and one against Pavel Kush on that regional scene. But for John Phillips, you kind of know what you're going to get. And that was really the game plan. When Hamza Shemaev took on John Phillips, everybody said, well, hey, one looping left hand from John Phillips could end the fight. And that's pretty much the only thing he was able to swing in that fight. Okay, now that's not really being fair to John Phillips because until that fight, no one knew how good Shemaev was. But yes, people know what the game plan is when they fight John Phillips at this point in his career. Does he have good boxing? Yes, he has good boxing. He has good power as well. I don't really like how his output and his power match because if you are a really big power guy, uh, Conor McGregor, for instance, comes to mind where Conor McGregor doesn't throw a crazy amount of volume, but when he does throw, he makes sure every punch uh, really counts. John Phillips kind of has that style where he's not throwing a lot of volume i never thought in my whole life by the way i'd compare john phillips <laughs> striking to conor mcgregor's but john phillips has that 
where he doesn't throw a lot of output, but personally, I don't have his power at that like 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10 level, where it can afford you to really wait back, wait back, wait back, and pick your shot. Because in John Phillips's case, I do think his inactivity comes to bite him, because he will wait for that perfect shot, wait for that perfect shot, and then his opponent shoots on him, or his opponent starts to pick up their volume. And once that happens, I find it takes the fight a little while to come to him. Jun Young Park... On the other hand, he's a good grappler, has good striking from the outside, and it is interesting because both guys' weaknesses are kind of the same. Neither guy's all that great at defending the takedown, which is good matchmaking by the UFC because I really doubt either guy's going to go for it. Park, I would argue, is the much more well-rounded out of the two. If the fight does go to the ground, he's got submissions, he's got really good ground and pound. His striking and his kicks, I do think, are going to be a big factor in this fight because his leg kicks from the outside and his movement compared to John Phillips, I do think, are going to be a really pro big problem for Phillips. Phillips already not the most mobile guy, and if Park can just start hammering that leg on the outside and use his movement a lot, I think Phillips is going to have a hard time tracking him down as the fight continues. That's the thing. Jun Young Park certainly has the volume for this one. I know you can't really look too much into those UFC stats because you don't have enough uh, enough of a body of work for Jun Young Park out of his two fights, but he does have a positive striking differential through the two and i mean his loss to hernandez was by finish so take that for what it's worth he does have a win over mark andre barrio but for jun young park on the regional scene he was taking on good names uh finland's glenn spire is one of them as well as a finish win over ray cooper the third you can go back and look at the so pictures nice. that was a really nice setup on that anaconda choke that he had there he also fought and lost to shavat rachmanov who i know the ufc holds in very high regard Look at who he's going to be taking on in his UFC debut. Kind of crazy there. But in this fight, Jun Young Park, I like the setups. I like the volume. And he does have a little bit of power on the end of his shots as well. It's all things to like here. And it feels like you've got the more well-rounded uh, martial artist on the left-hand side of our screen here. And John Phillips, I mean, at 35 years of age, you don't want to give it to him as too much of a slight. But 32 pro fights uh, and one of them ending in a no contest, making it 33. But overall, it hasn't been a good run in the UFC. He had that crazy, you know, Cinderella story type of knockout over Alan Amadovsky to keep him around. But it's tough to uh, look good against Hamzat Shmaev. He did learn that in his last time out. So he's kind of looking to regroup. This is probably, a, you know, one of those last-ditch yeah, efforts. Just, I think it's too early for John Phillips, honestly. That Shmaev fight wasn't that long ago. He took a lot of damage. Like... You have to remember, those Shemaev stats that you see where he's outstriking his opponents, like, combined 211 to 3, John Phillips is one of those guys. And if you're taking that level of damage in your fights, I'm a true believer of take six months off, but John Phillips is in different Or do guy. the Thomas Almeida and take years off. We'll see him later on in this card. But if we have a look over on Topology, 684 total votes, 82% going with Park, 69% going with Park to win by decision. If you look at the odds, Park is quite a big favorite. Open as a minus 220. He's now about a minus 250 average on best fight odds. John Phillips, open plus 185. He's at about a plus 200. I'm fairly confident going with Junyon Park to get the win in this one. Would I be overly surprised with a finish? I would. I mean, the, the fight against Jack Marshman, if you want to see a slobber knocker of a sleeper knocker fight, it was John Phillips, Jack Marshman. But Jun Young Park definitely has upside in the career, and I think he's certainly the fighter to go with here. Oh, 100%. Just no matter where the fight goes, I trust Park a little bit more. And especially even on the feet where Phillips, I would say, is at his best, I just think Park has a lot more he can throw at Phillips to keep him thinking throughout the fight. So uh, Park, by decision, probably a safe bet. Matt, both of us going with Jun Young Park to pick up the win. It would be his second in a row. We'll John Phillips be able to spoil it that's for you to tell us so let us know below in the comments we get an extended look at our main event between T-City Brian Ortega making the comeback taking on the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung you're gonna to want to keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks Matt and as we always say let's get into it Matt, I've got a couple of like low-key picks that I'm always going to have in the back of my mind that I'm always going to talk about in incredibly high regard, and they're the underdogs, the guys that nobody ever focuses on. And in this fight, we have one of those Craig's underground picks, Claudio Silva. This guy, what can I say? You look at the record of 14-1, and you might think, well, Craig, why are you so high on this guy? Because his jiu-jitsu is absolutely amazing, and he's on a huge win streak. He lost his debut, so he's won 14 straight fights. You look at the wins in the UFC. He beats Brad Scott. All right, who cares? He beat Leon Edwards, who's in the title conversation. He beat Nordin Taleb. He beat Danny Roberts. He beat Cole Williams. And now he's taking on James Krause. He is my welterweight, Leonardo Santos. And I don't get to say that very often because neither one of those guys fight very often. And that's the issue for Claudio Silva. He fights Williams in 2019. He fights Roberts in 2019. Once in 2018 against Nordin Taleb. The Leon Edwards fight was almost six years ago. 
Claudio Silva hasn't been overly, um, what could you say? Active. Active. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And for the James Krause, I mean, it seems like every weekend, Glory Fitness and MMA, we have to talk about them like that. We have to mention it in the, the same breath that Laura Sanko would with her teammates over there because we just continually see them pumping out quality fighters at the UFC level. And you see them coming up in the smaller organizations, the CFFC, CESs, more or less at the LFAs, coming out of Missouri. James Krause really leading the charge. You see him cornering a lot of fighters. And I know we've talked about this in the past with fighters like... It's weird because he's on the broadcast panel now, but the Michael Chiesas, the Rashad Evans, the Michael Johnsons, where they've cornered a lot of their guys, and we've seen it pay some dividends in some of their fights. I know Michael Johnson might seem like a poor example, but you see guys later on in their careers or as they progress really you know, bestow their wisdom upon some of their pupils. And for James Krause, it's worked out very well. This is a guy that you might have counted out a long time ago in his in his original run with the UFC. He's really put things together lately. I know his last fight was a loss to Trevin Giles, but it's a lot closer than just an L on your record. Exactly. And I'm going to shout it to Lance Stevenson, Born Ready, because that's what James Krause's nickname should be, Born Ready. James Krause fought at 155, 170, and 185, and the fight at 185 was on like a day's notice just because he was in town court ordering another one of his fighters anyways they're like hey you want to fight trevin giles i'll be honest thought he beat trevin giles he completely outgrappled him in the first round trevin giles beat him in the second round then the third round is pretty back and forth uh, giles of course is quite tired by that point so is kraus but i gave kraus the nod in that decision i thought he deserved it and how crazy would that have been too for james kraus on one day's notice to move up a weight class he's never fought in and beat trevin giles a fairly good fighter besides that though James Krause has an opponent who I think uh, represents Claudio Silva very, very well. So James Krause fought Willie Alves, and that was a fight that I was really concerned because I know James Krause is a phenomenal grappler, but when you start to hear those names of the Claudio Silvas, the Worley Alves, like, those are the guys who, they've got that one-shot, one-kill jiu-jitsu on the ground, kind of similar to Brian Ortega in our main event where any second of grappling that you spend with these guys, it's always dangerous, and James Krause just beat him everywhere, isn't it? Alves, another guy who, not the most active guy in the world, but yeah. he has wins over those top level competitions. He has wins yeah. over the guys like Colby Covington. So we're going to bring it up for Claudio Silva. We have to bring it up for Wally Alves. And James Krause is able to go out there, not only outstrike him, but out wrestle him. And I thought he put on a really good performance in that fight. Now, yes, Wally Alves isn't the same fighter that he used to be in those fights, but the grappling does hold up no matter what. And I thought James Krause looked great in that fight. And Sergio Mahais, too, those were back to back fights against two world class jiu jitsu guys. James Crow is able to beat them. And it's kind of this consistent thing that we've seen in James Crow as of late, where he's much more of a finisher now than he used to be early on in his career because. I think people know how good his grappling are and they're kind of hesitant about him shooting for takedowns and it really opens up his striking and his striking it's not the flashiest that you're ever going to see but he just has that kind of perfect mix of I'm a volume striker but if I can start to land my combinations I can put you away so James Krause I do think is the much more well-rounded out of these two guys but if Claudio Silva can take him down at any point in the I mean we saw it with Nordin Taleb I remember the commentary leading up to that fight was well, Claudio Silva he's been out for a while like yeah he beat Leon Edwards but it's been a bit and you know after four years you don't know what you're going to see and Nordin Taleb at the time at least was still a, a highly regarded welterweight Claudio Silva choked him out like it was nothing he just went through him like a hot knife through butter so although I do think very highly of Claudio Silva I think he needs to win in one way he needs to get this fight to the ground whereas James Krause I think if he takes down Silva he is at least comfortable enough and a good enough grappler, grappler that in top position he won't be getting submitted I don't think he'll get swept and I think on the feet James Krause is the much better striker out of the two well, now I mean, we look at the total uh, amount of votes on this one over on topology to 624 56% going Krause 72% saying he's going to win by decision the 44% that have Silva 59% saying he's going to win by submission. If we have a look at the odds, they're very close for this one. James Krause, the favorite, he opened a minus 115. That line dropped quick, and he's now a minus 185 favorite. For Silva, opened a minus 105. He's now a plus 154. I think this is one of the more competitive fights. It's a bit of a head scratcher, too, and I do like the odds here. I do think that they make a lot of sense. I mean, Claudio Silva's won 14 fights in a row, and he's been able to finish some pretty decent names. And for James Krause, the recent run, I mean, just scratch the fight against Trevin Giles and consider what you have. A lot of great wins. Now, Worley Alves, I squint and I make faces, this and that, but Worley Alves was a guy that had said consistently that he's been inconsistent and he just doesn't show up, kind of like the Donald Cerrone of Brazil. He just goes into big fights and just can't deliver, Worley Alves. But overall, yeah, I agree with you. James Krause is a much more well-rounded fighter in this one. 
Claudio Silva is really sketchy. Because again, that jujitsu, if you leave something out there, like he wears a dark hood. If, <laughs> if he walks down dark alleys, that's where you find Claudio Silva. The mean streets of Coconut Creek, Florida. I've been there. I ate at your steak and shake. It was great. Uh, but as far as this fight goes, I think it's really competitive. I think Claudio Silva, there's definitely an opportunity. This might be one of the few times, though, where he's one of my guys. I'm going to side with James Krause ever so slightly in this fight, though. I've been saying James Krause all day, but right when Craig said James Krause, something clicked in my head, and I'm like, Claudio Silva's probably going to submit James Krause. It's just one of those fighters who Claudio Silva you don't expect a lot from. And again, that's kind of his own fault due to the inconsistency. He is a little bit older at this point. But Claudio Silva's constantly in the gym training for fights, whereas James Krause, he's openly said, like, he doesn't really even want to fight anymore. Like, when he wants to fight, he'll accept fights. But other than that, like, he's more than happy to just continue to becoming or continue being a trainer and be kind of the head of his gym. I'm not saying that means James Krause isn't in shape, of course. I just mean Claudio Silva is much more dedicated to, okay, I'm trying to win these fights, whereas James Krause's dedication is more, I'm trying to help these other people win their fights. And I think the motivation for Silva, if he can get a really nice submission win in this, maybe give him a ranked opponent just because, you know, give respect to his win streak. I know he's not a name that a lot of people know, and I know he's not the most spectacular of guys, but at a certain point, if you win 15 in a row, people are going to have to start taking notice. So I'm going to pick Claudio Silva. My heart is saying James Krause, but my brain is saying Claudio Silva in this one. You're a dingus. I'm going Krause. You're going Silva. I'm really looking forward to this one, though. We've got a great card coming up, including an extended look at our main event between Brian Ortega coming back after a really long layoff, taking on Chansung Jung, the Korean Zombie. So you're going to want to keep it locked in with Fighting in Picks, Matt, as we always say. Let's, Let's get into it. Really good fight coming up at Women's Flyweight. We've got a clash of styles, and you always like to see that. You've got the Canadian, the Savage, Jillian Robertson, taking on Brazil's Poliana Botelho. And Matt, we've seen Poliana Botelho's teammate out of Novo Nyao finding a lot of success in Ketlin Vieira at 135. I mean, you know how good her wrestling is, how good her jiu-jitsu is, but it's her hands that have really started to make a difference in a lot of her fights. She's really gained a lot in her boxing. Well, Pauliana Batelio, from what we've seen so far, plenty of finish wins on her record, but it's certainly her hands and her kicks that really set things up nicely. She's got a really wide stance that you don't see all that often. She can plant throw that kick from the back half, and really let her hands go. And that's where we've seen her find success. I know this Siri Kondo fight was one that a lot of people like to point to. She's got that win in the UFC. She's got one over Pearl Gonzalez. And in her last time out, a win over somebody whose name I get mixed up all the time with Lauren Murphy, Lauren Mueller. And it was a big win there for her. Now, the thing that was a little troubling in that fight, and I will lead with this, was the fact that her output went down as that fight went on, and Laura Mueller started to wear a little bit on her. So there was that. But from what we've seen with Pauliana Batelio, she's been relatively inactive in the last five years. If we go back five fights, the fifth fight was about five years ago. The fight against Pearl Gonzalez was three years ago. Uh, Siri Kondo, two and a half about. Calvillo, almost two years. And then we haven't seen her in the octagon since the Mueller fight. That was a year and five months ago. For Jillian Robertson, she's been very active. And Matt, I know you can really talk and stress on her groundwork. And we saw it in her last fight against oh. the tough out in Courtney Casey. So yeah, Courtney Casey, who was actually just coming off a submission win of her own going into that fight. And I got to be honest, you try to cheer for Canadians when you are one. But that fight, I was really worried for Jillian Robertson. Just because Courtney Casey, you know what you're going to get. She's a good striker. She can stay on the outside. And she's been in there with some of the best. And I really do think that's an important thing. Courtney Casey might not have won against all of the best, but she's been in there with the Michelle Watterson. She's been in there with the Angela Hills. She's been in there with a very high level of competition. And for Jillian Robertson to go out there and submit her in the first round was one of, it was just really surprising, but I think it has shown the growth in Robertson's game. She has left American Top Team and now trains primarily just with Dean Thomas kind of at his own gym. She recently got a black belt in jiu-jitsu from him as well, so congrats. But I really do think that that transition has been great for her because Dean Thomas, when he was an American Top Team, he's focusing on so many different athletes. You've got, you know, the Woodleys, the Masvidal's, the Poirier's, there's the Covington's at the time. Like there's so many world-class fighters and really name fighters that a lot of people would recognize that he would have to split his time with. But now he has a much smaller roster of fighters. So you get a lot more one-on-one -on -one training with him. And he's really taken Robertson under his wing. And again, I do think it's shown. I even think in the Courtney Casey fight, her striking looked improved. I think her setups for her takedowns look better. And I do think that's going to be the important part in this fight. Because what you had mentioned about Patelio is that her movement's so good, and she does have deceiving power for this division. At 125, I mean, other than like Valentina Shevchenko, not a lot of women in that division who have a crazy amount of pop on their shots, but I, I would put uh, Pollyanna in that category of she can finish you if she is going to start landing some of those open strikes. 
Robertson's loss to Macy Barber is a little interesting uh, in this fight. Now, in Macy Barber, you have a much more powerful puncher than you do in Pollyanna Patelio, but I do think her game set or her skill set is a little bit more limited. She doesn't have the variety of shots. She's much more boxing oriented. And Robertson just wasn't able to get out of her way. She got hit with one bad shot and just kept on getting worse. She just kept on eating punches from that point on. I do think that was the fight that was kind of, okay, where are we going to go from here? Are we going to keep on doing the same stuff? Just try to go for takedowns and submit people? Or are we going to try to sort of evolve the rest of our MMA uh, skill set? And Robertson has been able to do that. I like what you had said, Clash of Styles, because you would have to imagine if Pollyanna's going to win, it'll either be by decision, she'll be able to stuff the takedowns, really move well on the feet, or Robertson's going to be able to take her down, take her back, and choke her. So I think this is a super fun fight, though, for the 125 division. And it's a tough one to try and predict. I don't think that the odds really do it justice. We'll get there soon, but the total picks over on Tapology at a 699, 73% going Robertson, 63% saying she's going to win by submission. If we have a look at the odds, Jillian Robertson's a pretty big favorite. Open minus 235. Uh, there was quite a bit of quick money that came in on Robertson. It bounced back up. It's kind of moved around since. She's minus 240 average over there on best fight odds. Botelio open plus 200, now a plus 193 underdog. I think it should be a lot closer to that because, again, it's tough. You've got the inactivity from Pollyanna Botelio, so that's where the question marks come in. Uh, again, the, the Ketlin Vieira comparisons as far as what she can do on the feet. I think she, that she has tons of power. I do like the kicks. I do like that wide stance, especially for somebody that like Robertson that... How is she going to get the takedowns? How is she going to initiate them? Grab the single gonna, leg because her is legs Is she going to grab the single leg? It, could Jillian Robertson really attack that front leg? Because Batelio stands really, really heavy on her lead leg. I made the comparison. Matt missed it. But if you watch the fight um, against Kondo, I know she gets the knockout. But early on, you're thinking, geez, it's kind of like Nate Diaz stands really heavy on his lead leg. It's something that broadcasters pick apart. And then they say, well, why aren't they kicking it? Why aren't they kicking it? Well, for Pollyanna Batelio, that's the first thing that I noticed. And again, am I in the corner of Siri Kondo? No. And if I was, well, she lost the fight. So sorry. But in this one, can Robertson really capitalize? Will she go for an ankle pick? Will she go for a so. single leg? Will we see anything like that out of her? Can she initiate the grappling early? Or will she be able to just kind of wear on Botelio and just drain that gas tank? Because we've seen it where Botelio's dropped off before. Now, do I think that's going to happen in this fight? I find this one of the tougher fights to try and actually predict on the card. It's really competitive, and I, I like that. I like the upside on the underdog here in Pollyanna Batelio, and I think if she can really just get out to a quick pace early, I think it should be her fight uh, Her fight here on Saturday. And that's a fair pick, and again, the odds aren't exactly where I put them. I do see this much more of an even fight. Maybe Jillian Robertson minus 160 at the high end, yeah. but... I still think she's going to be able to get it done. I do think the grappling is going to be a lot for Telio to deal with, and especially the way that her cardio is. If you are able to wear on her, especially in that first round, it's going to make the rest of the fight really open up for you. And go back to Jillian Robertson's first fight in the UFC. Yes, Molly McCann might not be at the top of the division, but for that to be your UFC debut and you choke her unconscious, like bad, bad, I just think Jillian Robertson's level of grappling has even gotten better even since then. I do think she'll be able to win this, probably even by submission. I'll even call the stoppage. Matt, but I'm really looking forward to this. You're going with the Canadian and Jillian. Jillian Robertson, I'm going against Canada and everything it stands for with Brazil's Poliana Batelio. I'm really looking forward to this card, Matt. We've got a lot of interesting fights, including extended look at our main event between Brian T. City Ortega and Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie. So you're going to want to keep it locked in for that. And Matt, as we always say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Straight up, this is my favorite fight on this card. And we've gotten really excited about a lot of fights here recently. Some ones that you should watch. Jordan Williams, Nasty Nimovov. Drikas Duplessis taking on a really tough out, Marcus Perez. Well, this weekend we have Mateus Gamer Gamrot, the former featherweight and lightweight KSW champion, taking on Guram Kutateladze. And Matt, I'm really excited because Mateus Gamrot was originally supposed to be taking on my guy, Magomed Mustafayev. And that fight would have shot me over the moon with excitement. But Mustafayev's out, in steps Guram Kutateladze, and Matt, it is a difficult name to pronounce, but we've seen a lot of Georgians recently really break through with the UFC, and in Kutateladze's last time out, we saw Ilya Taparia in his corner with Brave. We've also seen, I mean, you look at it last weekend, Giga Chikadze gets a win, Taparia gets a win. We've seen Rob Doshvili really uh, skyrocket to start and become a ranked bantamweight. So for Guram Kutateladze, this is a really good opportunity to really put on a statement and get a win over a former double champ with a promotion outside the UFC. 
and we high we hold KSW to a really high regard. I mean, I just said last weekend's Drinkus. fight that I wanted you to watch, Drikus Duplessis, and man, the guy looked nervous, he looked tentative, he had the jitters, and he came through. Holy smokes, was I nervous about that fight. But for Mateus Gamron, I mean, he's been fighting five-round fights for the longest time, an ADCC European champ in grappling, and I mean, he's taken on a who's who in MMA. I mean, Kleber Kweke Erbs, for me, was a really big win for him uh, not that long ago, back in 2018. Kweke Erbs, really uh, credentialed grappler. I mean, the win over Norman Park, there's a UFC name. He's beaten him twice. They fought three times total. They, it looked like they were going to fight again, but that fight didn't happen. Uh, Mateusz Gamrot, his last time out there, picking up the big win over Marian Zielkowski. But Matt, we talk about it. I mean, while we might not have KSW prediction videos, they're out there, though, with Fight Night Pitch. You can find them in the collection. We're very much KSW fans, and we will certainly okay. watch KSW. I mean, you had a huge event, 55 last weekend. Look at that finish win that you had in your main event, the Scott Ashkin fight against Kaladov. But overall, Mateusz Gamrot, what we know about him, very, very well-rounded, and this is a long time coming, this UFC debut. Oh, 100%. And you can say that about a lot of KSW guys, honestly. Like, that's the level of competition that they have. But we see this in a lot of other organizations, and I do think Craig will agree with me on this. Champions in most organizations would be, like, top 10 contenders in the UFC. It's just kind of after that top three, that's where a lot of other promotions don't have kind of the sheer volume of top-level fighters that the UFC does. Because really, when you look at the UFC's, like, top 15 for lightweight, any one of those guys could be champ on any given day. That's how stacked it is. But... With the KSWs, you have the guys like Gamera out there who you're just kind of waiting for them to get their chance eventually to kind of prove it against that top level of competition. And finally, we're at that point. Guram, and now I'm going to attempt this, Kukataladze. No. Nope. All right, well, Kukataladze is, like you had said, kind of representing that Georgian wave all of a sudden and not really a wave that we ever saw coming because, you know, MMA full, a lot of Brazilians, a lot of Russians. Georgian, not the first country you now, think Now, let's say this. So for Guron Kutateladze, one of the stories that I read, it was on MMA NYTT, was the fact that he made his MMA debut in an unsanctioned fight when he was nine years old. This guy, if you've seen it, uh, you see him drilling on the pads over at All-Stars in Sweden. Now, we've talked about All-Stars a lot. We make the joke about one of their best MMA fighters. And Matt, can you guess who that is? Light heavyweight in the UFC? Alexander Gustafsson. No, it's not Alexander Gustafsson. They do have Gustafsson, but I'll come back to that. But they do have one of the best welterweights and middleweights in the entire world right now with Hamzat Shemaev. Good buddies with Guram Kutateladze. But overall, I mean, this guy, you can see it in that picture. I mean, the Boar's uh, logo right on there. But he's definitely drilling and training with some of the best guys in the world at this juncture. We saw him in the States um, at the Performance Institute. There's a picture over on the IGs with the Dan Ige's and the, uh, the, the Ali Abdelaziz's of the world. So there is a connection there. But I really expect this guy to make a statement. Maybe his UFC debut, it's a tough test against Mateus Gamera. But we've seen Guram Kataladze in some of his recent performances, especially that last one against Felipe Silva. Man, this guy has a ton of power, but he will eat a shot. A exactly. And this isn't really the guy you want to find out how many shots you can eat against. Because Mateus Gamera, yes, we're, you know, giving you his grappling credentials, can get it done wherever the fight goes. And I really do think the fact that he's had so many five-round fights in KSW will really help him, especially at the start of his UFC career. Because you got to think, a guy who's used to going 25 hard minutes, 15 is going to be fairly easy for him. And it's been a while since he's been in a 15-minute uh, fight, not 15-round fight. So I do think the cardio is definitely going to hold up his grappling second to none really and the striking is always going to be there for him with Gamrot, you gotta think he will expect to go for that takedown at some point but I, I like how his submissions aren't just because he's going for the takedown then trying to strangle you it's okay if i drop you why waste all my energy going for ground and pound let's try to go for a submission he's a very intelligent fighter that way and i do think that his overall fight iq is really going to help him in this fight yeah and i mean we go back a little bit the trivia i had for you, if you got a chance to think about it go con now you know. 595 total votes on this one over on Tapology. Smaller sample size because, again, you have Kukateladze coming in on short notice for Magomed Mustafaya. But 92% of voters going with Gamrot. 74% predicting he wins by decision. Mateus Gamrot, pretty decent favorite. Open a minus 305. Still a minus 305. Kukateladze, see? It's tough, isn't it? Open plus 225. He's around a plus 242 over on best fight odds. I certainly like the KSW champion in this one. Though I will say... 
If Guram Tateladze gets a win, I would expect it incredibly early. I mean, if you look at some of his fights, he's certainly a finisher. Um, you know, we go back to, geez, I mean, from the early days, getting finishes. But if you really want to look back and see a good win, that Felipe Silva's oh one. But you talked about it. It's a crazy about minute of action. Kutataladze does get hit. He's got a chin, and Silva rips him to the body hard, and Ooh. it's it's amazing. Kutataladze, he withstands the pressure somehow, lands a wild hook from the depths of hell, and gets a huge win there. This is a guy that you definitely want to watch for moving forward. I think Gamrot's a bit too tough a test to start off with, but hey, if he gets a win, that'd be amazing. I'm going with Gamrot. So am I. And the last thing, I would have really liked to see the matchup Gamrot with a guy like maybe like a Bobby Green or like a Clay Guida, a guy who's been in the UFC for a while, so that you can give a ch you can give uh, Gamrot the chance of yes, KSW doesn't have an overwhelming North American audience, but at least give the North American fans. Uh, uh, a recognizable opponent that is beatable you hate to say that because you don't want you know winnable fights in the UFC but give him a guy with a name next or with a name value that he could go out there and beat that's what I really would have liked but I think fight wise excitement uh this is gonna be second to that this is such a good fight but Gamrot yeah I'm really looking forward to it we both have Mateus Gamrot maybe Guram Kutateladze can surprise us but Matt this should be a great card there's so many underdog or uh, undervalued fights like True. this one that you definitely have to check out and keep it locked in for extended preview of Brian Ortega taking on the Korean Zombie in our main event. Matt, as we always say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it. If you're a fan of the UFC video game franchise, you probably recognize the guy on the left-hand side of this picture. If you're a fan of UFC watching in general, maybe you're new to the sport from 2020 because there's been so many of you joining the Fight Night Picks fold that I, it's hard to keep track of, and we really do appreciate you. You might not be familiar with the guy on the left-hand side of the screen. We have Thomas Almeida, the return of the Mac, and he's taking on Jonathan just call me Dragon. Martinez. And I'm really looking forward to this fight because from Jonathan Martinez, he's a guy that came in on short notice to the UFC, and it was one of those, what are we going to get? I mean, he had competed with Combate in the past. He had lost to Matt Schnell. He had beaten Randy Hines over with Fist Fight Night 2. And he came into the UFC take on Andre Sukumtoth. And I thought, okay, well, this was UFC Moncton, and I was there covering it. And you had Jonathan Martinez. That fight was on the main card, strangely enough. And when we interviewed him, you could barely get two words out of the poor guy. He was he was just a really nervous guy. I mean, he's kind of like shy, and it is what it is. He loses that fight to Sukumtoth, and it was up a weight class. It just wasn't really a close fight for him, or we thought it was up a weight class. Then he takes on Waliji Buren, gets a big win there. He knocks out Liu Ping Wong in an awesome nice fight. Loses to Andre Yule. It was a close fight by split decision. Just about everybody thought that Martinez yeah. won that fight. And then he comes out against Frankie Signs in a fight where... I mean, it was almost a slam dunk. Jonathan Martinez is going to beat Frankie Signs. You had seen what Frankie Signs looked like against Marlon Vera. It was pretty much a throwaway. Martinez is going to do the same. But you can see it up on the screen where I put it. Jonathan Martinez weighed in 140.5 pounds for a fight at Bantamweight. That's bad. And that fight was about two months ago. I don't like that. I mean, yes, Martinez looked great in the fight. Obviously, he did. And Thomas Almeida, I said it from the jump. You might not be familiar with him, but let me school you if you're not familiar. This was a guy that beat every can he could. He took the primo pasta. He took the, the tomato soup. He took whatever he could on the regional scene, like this can of Red Bull, and smashed it on his forehead and wild, just man. beat everybody. And he looked amazing. And then he came into the UFC and he faced competition. So he fights Matt's guy. Tell me about his fight with UFC 196. Or, sorry, what? he beat Tim Gorman in his debut. And, I mean, he had fought in Legacy. He was their vacant Bantamweight champ. They love to throw those around. Casey Kenny, former vacant Bantamweight champ or interim Bantamweight champ. But he beats Tim Gorman, and then he has some competitive fights. Tell me Thomas Almeida's trajectory even especially, I guess, after the win over Anthony Burchak. So we talk about this a lot. We're, there's fighters in their first five or six fights in the UFC, and you'll look at the record, and it'll be like, okay, so they've lost to Benil Dariush and Paul Felder, but their wins are over two guys who are no longer in the UFC anymore. So you're in this weird territory, and he, it, where it's kind of hard to judge that person's talent. Thomas Almeida might be the most extreme version of that case we've ever seen in MMA. And I don't think that's an exaggeration, because you have to remember... Go back to 2015 U, and Thomas Almeida is at the top of the world. He knocked out Brad Pickett in one of the greatest fights of all time. That's the one that I'm really going to highlight because 
in that fight at the point or at that point in Almeida's career sorry he was known as this phenomenal striker he didn't have much regard for getting hit and he threw everything and using the term buzzsaw kind of goes to his style as well there's spinning elbows flying knees and really good Muay Thai practitioner as well has great elbows from the clinch can kind of do everything from an offensive standpoint Here's the problem, though. Thomas Almeida doesn't have his hands up ever, and it's not like he's a Mark Hunt where, okay, if my hands aren't up, I can take an ungodly amount of punishment. Thomas Almeida gets dropped in every single one of his fights, and the Pickett fight was the first one that stood out where I started to get worried about him kind of long-term, because Brad Pickett at that stage of his career, he had went from Bantamweight, longtime WEC fighter, longtime UFC guy, moves down to Flyweight, doesn't go all that well for him, and then this was his return back after Bantamweight, very hyped up fight, but it was kind of one of those squash matches where it was, okay, we're going to have this young guy who's going to beat the well-known uh, veteran of Brad Pickett, and of course, that's the result, but if you actually go back and watch that fight, Brad Pickett drops Thomas Almeida like three times, shatters his nose, completely outboxes him, and then once Almeida starts to, you know, do his crazy stuff, he's able to hit Brad Pickett with one of the greatest flies any knockouts you'll ever see but from that point on it's been a really weird career trajectory don't know why that was so difficult he fights Cody Garbrandt in his first UFC main event and that was at a point where okay if Almeida wins this fight it's on like he might not fight for the title next but he's gonna fight one of those Uriah Fabers a TJ a Dominic Cruz just he's gonna fight one of the top guys in the division uh Cody Garbrandt went out there and knocked him out and it wasn't even close the boxing of Garbrandt really got to Almeida and I think that's a problem for Almeida when you do look at his other losses as well you got the Jimmy Rivera's and the Rob Fonts in there Jimmy Rivera doesn't have power behind his shots but technically as a boxer he is quite good and then Rob Font of course uh another, all power all power another one of Craig's like weird favorite fighters but he's got great range on his shots good kicks and great boxing as well Almeida is so hittable and it just when that's the characteristic I think of when I first think of what Thomas Almeida is as an MMA fighter, yes, I think of the violent finishes that he has, but I also think about all those times that I've seen him get cracked and get really, really hurt. Now, Jonathan Martinez isn't a Rob Font level striker. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not here to tell you that. But what he is is a very dangerous threat in every area of MMA because if Thomas Almeida comes back and just thinks, okay, they're giving me Jonathan Martinez, I should be ranked right now and kind of disregards Martinez's skills, I think it's going to be a long night for Almeida because Martinez can crack you on the feet. If it goes to the mat, I'm more than comfortable with him on top of Thomas Almeida. I think that's probably what he's going to be going for anyways and kind of switch it up. But with Almeida, again, if you lose to Jimmy Rivera, Rob Font, and Cody Garbrandt, no shame in that. I'm sure there's other guys out there with those three losses on their careers. But then to have your UFC wins be guys like Anthony Berchak and Brad Pickett, it just kind of puts you in this really weird category where I don't know if Thomas Almeida's a uh, prospect anymore i don't know if he's a contender i don't know if he's you hate to use the word kind of has been but i don't really know what thomas almeida is at this stage of his career it's tough to tell which thomas almeida you're going to get i think that's a really good yeah. point and that's what makes this fight interesting and tough to try and predict because on his best day he's a contender in the bantamweight division on his worst day he's a guy that can't crack the top 15 let alone a top 20 or top 25 so it leaves a lot of question marks i mean if you have a look at it over on the instagram looks as good as he ever has and if you have a look over on topology he had a bout that was supposed to happen in 2019 against marlon vera eye right. injury he's supposed to take on alejandro perez in this fight martinez steps in on short notice with perez out so if we have a look i mean in totality over on topology to the predictions 580 of them 73 wow. percent going with almeida 61 percent predicting him to win by knockout and if we look at the odds, there's a limited sample size of the odds. Almeida open an average of a minus 190 favorite. He's now a minus 111 or so. Martinez open plus 165. I mean, it's a pick em fight at this point in terms of the odds. I like that for Almeida. Again, we're talking upside. This guy could be, you know, a ranked bantamweight. And I don't think it's, it's not too far-fetched to say it. I do worry, though, because, again... This is a guy that's one and three in his last four. He's been finished in two of those fights. Now, Garbrandt is a former champion who is on his rise to becoming a champion. Rob Font is a perennial contender. I wouldn't say that tomorrow he's going to challenge for he's the that title. He's 15 to 10 guy. But he's, yeah, he's your guy that's going to hang in there coming out of a great gym in Massachusetts at Lausanne's. But this is a competitive fight. If Martinez wins, boom. We're knocking on the door of the top 15. If Almeida wins, it's probably for sure a top 15 opponent. Yeah. And, you, you know, if he wins, it's going to be, oh, well, that was the tune-up fight, like you said. I'm taking Almeida. It's it's tough. And, okay. this, it The odds are so juicy that you want it. I'm going to pass, but 
I like Almeida in this one. So we're going to look bad no matter who we predict. Because if Almeida wins, it's going to be my first round knockout. And if he loses, it's probably going to be my first round knockout. Like, <laughs> I don't see this fight being overly competitive. It's just going to really be one way or the other. So I'm going to pick Jonathan Martinez just to be controver- to be the contrarian. I do need to get some picks on Craig. He kind of pulled ahead last weekend. So I'm going to say Jonathan Martinez. I trust his durability a lot more than I trust Thomas Almeida. Thomas Almeida had a very serious eye injury that he needs surgery for in all this time off. And he's been off for over two years, which is never something you want to see, especially with a guy like Almeida, who's a very much a rhythm fighter who has to kind of get into his, okay, leg kick, then open up my combinations. I think that time off might affect him a little bit more than it would other fighters. So I'm going to pick Jonathan Martinez in this one. Matt, I'm really looking forward to this fight. I've got Almeida. you got Martinez. We've got a great lineup coming up and it's headlined by an awesome fight between... Brian Ortega and the Korean Zombie, so you're going to want to keep it locked in for that, Matt. And as we always say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it. I really like our next fight. We have the Australian Jimmy the Brute Crew taking on Modestus, and this is a great nickname, the Baltic Gladiator Bukowskis out of Lithuania, former British kickboxing champion, and in his UFC debut, very controversial end to his fight against Andreas Mikhailidis. And that was a fight where Mihailidis, we'd seen him on the U.S. regional scene and the regional scene over in Europe. I mean, a fighter coming out of Greece, but he was typically had competed at middleweight. So he's moving up to 205. He pushed a pace against Bukowskis. The takedown defense was stood for Bukowskis. It was those weird elbows into a finish, the old Travis Brown, and Bukowskis kind of slips away with a win. So... He's on a tidy little win streak, former Cage Warriors, late heavyweight champion. And like I said, the kickboxing and the kicks are what we really like to see out of Bukowskis. Throws a nice one to the body. He can mix it up quite well. The one area, and I remember us when we were previewing the fight against Mikhailidis, was the fact that Bukowskis, when he gets backed up against the cage, it is an issue. And with Jimmy Crute, what's he good at? Wrestling and really pressuring. And if we look at Jimmy Crute's overall body of work over on UFC stats, and again, we have five total fights, one of them a contender series fight against Birchler. But for takedowns per average out of the 15 minutes, he averages 4.63 at an 81% clip. That's what you like at a Jimmy Crute. That's what we've seen against some decent opponents. I know it didn't work out against Misha Serkinov, who's kind of like at the next level and who has a lot of experience as well i mean jimmy crew you gotta remember you can see it on screen 24 years old bukowska's 26 so this is very much the future of the ufc's light heavyweight division jimmy crew though holy smokes this guy is rolling bukowska's with the striking crew with the takedowns it's very much a clash of styles. Does this fight interest you as much as it interests me? I actually I, really like this one. You seem to be at like an 8 out of 10. I, I'm like a 6 out of 10. I think Jimmy Crew does have a really bright future in the UFC. I think they push him more than they would your average fighter. And mainly due to the Australian connection. Jimmy Crew's an interesting case to me because... As the fight goes on, he looks exhausted from the first second, but his cardio doesn't really seem to shift. He just kind of looks that way when he fights. He looks kind of labored. What are the bigger uh, light heavyweights you're going to see? Both guys are, to be completely honest, but Jimmy Crute has a definite physicality to his game, and we've seen that in many of his fights. The Sam Alvey fight, another fight that some people thought was stopped a little early, but still, we saw a lot of his striking because... He can throw really good kicks for a really big guy. He's got great kicks, good boxing, but we all know what his bread and butter is. If he can get his arms around you, get you up against the cage, kind of drag you down to the ground, not only is his submission game very high level, but he does have phenomenal ground and pound. And I do think the Michael Ojechuk win was huge because Ojechuk was a guy who, yeah, he lost to OSP, but other than that, just kind of ran through people at a certain point. Look at that John Volante fight. Yeah, that was a really weird body punch, but... Jimmy Crew was able to go out there and just steamroll him. That fight wasn't not competitive in the slightest. And that was really the coming out party for me because after he lost to Serkinov, that felt like, okay, that's your chance to really get a number next to your name. You fall short of that. The next one is going to be the important one. What adjustments could you make from your first career loss? And he seemed to make them really well. He had great wrestling, like I had said, really good submissions. And I do think he's just a poor stylistic matchup for uh, Bukowskis in this fight because Bukowskis is going to have to keep this on the outside, really use his movement well throw a lot of leg and body kicks i would imagine and try to keep it within that kicking range whereas jimmy crew constantly he can play that game with you if that's what you give him but he's always going to want to get into that kind of boxing clinch range and if he does get bukowskis up against the cage i have a feeling that like that 100 percent takedown defense will not be the same by the end of the fight and i mean we we saw it and the reason why i bring up that takedown defense you got to go back and watch some of the fights that bukowskis had on the regional scene and if we're going back to the last five fight star championship and then it was cage warriors 
Marcin Wojcik that a lot of people recognize in that fight it was an, it was it could have been an issue in the Nosiglia fight where he won it by knockout but that was another issue where Nosiglia was starting to find success and you worry and if you look over on Tapology out of 735 total votes 81% going Crute 59% saying he's going to win by submission the odds overwhelmingly in the favor of Crute he opened a minus 180 favorite he's now minus 349 average on best fight odds Bukowskis opened plus 155 I wish I could have got Crute when he was as low as he was and Bukowskis now at a plus 270 and I know that we frame this video pretty well all Crute but if, again if you watch Modestus Bukowskis you'll know that that takedown like I can't stress this enough his takedown defense isn't that great unless it's totally turned to 180 I don't see him winning this fight over Jimmy Crute now here's one really good positive though they're 24 and 26 you can lose at this stage in your career and it's not the end of the world and especially in a division like 205 again we hear all these new names at 205 you know we have a new champion all of a sudden with Jan Blachowicz there's new guys in the division but let's be honest it's still a fairly thin division in the men's uh side of things you gotta think heavyweight light heavyweight probably two of the more uh thin divisions i would say at least but jimmy crute i do think has a good chance to kind of make his way up the rankings i do think the Serkinov loss was a learning experience for him and i do think he will be better because of it but because even if he loses this fight it, nothing to hang your hat on if you lose to jimmy crute it's one of the worst stylistic matchups in the division for you and that's even with ranked opponents being considered so I think Bukowskis has a very bright future, but I'm going to pick Crute in this one and probably by submission. Matt, both of us going with Jimmy Crute to get the win. It's a great card, oh. great main card. Our co -main. Cyril Gaon taking on Anche D'Elia. And in our main event, you've got the Korean Zombie taking on Brian Ortega. An extended look at that one. So you're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, Matt, as we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. What an interesting fight on our main event at Flyweight. And I'm not joking, at Flyweight, we have the blonde fighter, Caitlin Chukagian, former title challenger, taking on Brazil's Jessica Andrade. And we're talking about the former women's strawweight champion, Jessica Andrade. And I know in her last two fights, both of them losses. But again, we're talking about Zhang Wei Li and then the Rose Nama Yunus fight. Very, very interesting in both of those. I mean, finished in the one and a split decision in the last one against Nama Yunus, the rematch. And for Caitlin Chukagian... She's one and one against Shevchenko. Just anybody named Shevchenko. Yeah. But the loss to Valentina in the title fight and then the win in her last time out against Antonina. I mean, Caitlin Chukagian looked like she took not just steps, but jumps, leaps, and bounds in her last fight from fights before. I mean, Caitlin Chukagian, I know, Matt, you've been pretty, I wouldn't say, whatever the opposite of high on a fighter is, low. you've been low on Caitlin Chukagian because she has been a point fighter. She's been a volume striker. She's been the same time in, time out. She's going to win by split decision. She's going to lose by split decision. But in her last fight, she almost looked like late career Holly Holm, just working the takedowns. Not even. She went out all there. over her yeah. opponents. She, she went did, out there she wrestling great. like Kamaru Usman. And it was really weird too because everyone expected, okay, you're this great volume striker who uses her movement a lot. And yes, I have it hard on Shukagian because if you watch 90% Shukagian fights, there's just a lot of, ha. Ah! And that's about it. And like not a lot afterwards. But she did really go for the finish, it felt, in the uh, Antonina Shevchenko fight. And it was the first time that I've ever watched Chukagin fight and thought, oh, she's actually trying to get out of there before the 15 minutes are over. Now, I know it sounds like I'm being really hard on her, and I sort of am, but she's been able to win doing that. So, uh, like, who am I to judge it? Kayla Chukagin. Like I mentioned, great movement on the outside. Really good front kicks, too. Good at using her distance. Good with a jab. She does, you know, stick, kind of move a lot. Andrade the opposite, and I really do think Andrade's last fight prepared her perfectly for this one. Now, the first time Andrade fought Rose Nama Yunus, she was getting completely destroyed and then slammed Nama Yunus on her head and knocked her out. And then, of course, she becomes champ, gets knocked out by Wei Li, and then has the rematch with Rose. And the first round, it was looking like it was going to be the same thing. Rose teeing her off, you know, using her movement, her knees, using her great boxing. And then Andrade, just as the fight was going, she wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away. And that's the thing that you really do have to like about Andrade. No matter how much movement a fighter is using, she's just going to march them down no matter what. Now, you would like to see her maybe cut off the cage a little bit better than just dart forward. But those darts and those blitzes forward, when she is just throwing those hooks and overhands, we had mentioned it in one of our earlier videos with uh, uh, Pollyanna Botella, but... Andrade, another one who, in this division, I think she has massive pop on her shots. I think she's going to be able to knock out a lot of people at 125. Because you got to think, she fought and beat Raquel Pennington at 135. She's fought at 115 and become champ of that division. And now she's meeting her, well, now she's meeting them in the middle at 125. I'm not going to say that Andrade is going to beat Valentina Shevchenko. But I personally do believe she's one of the harder matchups for Shevchenko moving forward in this division. Now, will she be able to beat Caitlin Shukagian? It's going to be a tough fight because it really does come down to, can Andrade get her hands around Shukagian? Because 
Chukagan's not going to fight Andrade like she did Antonina Shevchenko. Andrade A is a far superior grappler to uh, Antonina and physically strong as anyone in the women's divisions. I mean, Andrade, kind of her run towards the strawweight title was one of the more violent runs, really, that we've seen in MMA history. Because you're going to think, she was just throwing around like Claudia Gadella, Tisha Torres, fighters who at the time were in like the top five and all looked like at one point they could potentially fight for the title. Andrade beat the brakes off all of them. And then, of course, that terrible knockout over Kaylee Nikolakiewicz, where she sent her to, like, the Shadow Realm. That was really hard to watch, but Andrade, you know what you're going to get. She's like a female John Lineker. She's going to go out there, throw those big hooks, uh, big looping shots, and really want to work her way on the inside. The question for me, though, is what can Caitlin Chukagian do to really get Andrade to stop, to respect her striking? Because Chukagian, if she does go out there with that volume mindset, I do see Andrade kind of hunting her down as the fight goes on and really landing bombs. Because I mean, if you can outstrike Rose Nama Yunus and, like, really, really hurt her in a fight, then you can outstrike Caitlin Chikagian. Like, Rose Nama Yunus is an absurdly good striker. So for Andrade to be able to kind of figure out her game plan as the fight goes on, really show that high level of fight IQ and sort of figure it out as it was going on, I think this fight, she should be able to do kind of the same thing. And, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a narrative. Let us know who you're going with in the comments as well. But, I mean, in this one, I'm sure it's going to be a narrative, the height and reach differential. It's huge. I mean, six inches of reach for Chukagian and about eight inches of height that's insane but again you brought it up if you look at jessica andrage's overall body of work that she had before dropping to straw weight it was at a time before flyweight so you had to drop 20 pounds which is insane but i mean you look at that record marion renault Raquel Pennington I mean yeah Larissa she beat Pacheco. Pennington she lost to Pennington Larissa Pacheco is the one that stands out to me because if you paid attention I know PFL they're not doing too good right now but if you watched the last season of PFL Kayla Harrison and Larissa Pacheco at featherweight so Jessica Andrade to fight fighters that are that big uh, and then move down at 115, have success move back up to 125 wow. I could definitely see her finding success now Caitlin Chukagian it just, I wonder how good the takedown defense can be against somebody like Jessica Andrade because we saw the offense against uh, Antonina Shevchenko, but is she really the best at uh, fighting on the ground? No, she's not. She's very much a Muay Thai practitioner and kickboxer at heart. Now, if we look at Caitlin Chukagian overall through her UFC tenure, 50% takedown defense. That's not really the greatest. It's not like she's going for many takedowns. She did in her last fight. That was a bit of a surprise. If we have a look at the overall votes over on Tapology, at a 775, 74% going on Drage, 56% saying she's going to win by decision, 37% saying she could win by knockout. If we have a look at the odds, they are close. And Andrage opened a minus 190 favorite. That line popped up really quick. Uh, but now, minus 141 average uh, has kind of leveled out. Chukagian open plus 165 underdog. Now she's at plus 116. So the money has come in on Caitlin Chukagian, which is it a surprise? Maybe not so much. I will side, though, with the slight favorite in the former champion in Jessica Andrade. I think the power and the fact that she can really push a pace, that's something that you really like. Now, we always talk about this, Matt, with fight night picks. Technique versus just power in the wild blitzes. Usually technique wins out. I think this, the, in this fight, you have the added X factor of, well, if Andrade needs to wrestle and grapple, yeah. she can do that too. Usually with those tech, technical brawlers, you don't see that as much. Andrade is really that complete mixed martial artist, really ahead of her time. It's just a shame that the lower weight classes didn't exist in the UFC. Um, but I, I really do side with the Brazilian in this one here. So... Uh I, again, I'm going to side with Craig on this. I think Jessica Andrade, the power is in her favor. I think the cardio is in her favor. And that's not something we see a lot where a power puncher has great cardio. Jessica Andrade has that. And it's not like she doesn't have a crazy volume to go with it. She throws an extremely high volume. Every shot has a lot of pop on it. And she can keep it going for all five rounds. You saw that in the first of the, or the only Iwana fight, I should say. Andrade, and if it goes to the ground, let's say Caitlin Shukagian thinks, okay, I've got a pretty good double leg now. Jessica Andrade is really good at guillotines, and she's a phenomenal jiu-jitsu practitioner. So no matter where this fight goes, J Caitlin Shukagian is the one in danger. Because Andrade can knock her out on the feet, she can TKO her on the ground, she can submit her on the ground, whereas I really only see Caitlin Shukagian winning by a decision. So I've got to pick Jessica Andrade, and hopefully if she can get this win, 
there's not a lot of people I want to see fight Valentina right now. Jessica Andrade might be able to pose a few different things that, you know, none of her past opponents have. Because Andrade, one of the few power punchers that she would have to face. One of the few who could match her a little bit on the ground, perhaps. So, if Andrade can get this, the sky's the limit. Andrade Mayo would be cool, but it's going to be Maya Shevchenko. I'm looking forward to this one. We both have Jessica Andrade in the fight. Great card. Great co-main event. Yeah. Cyril Gunn taking on Anche Dalia in his UFC debut. And in our main event, the Korean Zombie taking on Brian Ortega. So, you're going to want to keep it locked in with Fighting Picks, Matt, as we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. This is an awesome co-main event. And listen, we've been pretty hard on unranked heavyweights going into co-main event slots. But you have a UFC debut from Croatia's Anche Dalia taking on France's Bon Gamet, Cyril Gaon, and Matt. I'm really excited about this. I mean, MMA Factory Cyril Gaon was in the losing corner of a uh, not-so-great fighter in Alain Bado last weekend. But... That means nothing in this one. From Cyril Gaon so far, a 6-0 undefeated record. I mean, he's such a crisp boxer, such a technical guy. And oh, by the way, he's so physically strong that if he so chooses to bring the fight to the ground, you saw what happened to Pazoa, you saw what happened to Dante Mays. This guy can really sling it. And you saw it in his fight, in a fight that I just didn't need to see for my poor old heart. But taking on Canada's Tanner Bowser, a really technical fight. He was able to win out there. That was a battle of some really good prospects. And you've seen the upside from Bowser since that fight. Well, Cyril gone undefeated. I mean, for me, and I've been saying this for a long time, so you can't say that I haven't. This guy is your dark horse to become a UFC heavyweight champion. Not just a challenger, a champion. He's the complete package, and we've seen it. But he's taken on a really tough out in Croatia's Anche Dalia, coming out of Crow Cop team. We've seen him. I mean, you look at it. He's got Alexander Rakic to train with. He's got Satoshi Ishii to train his wrestling. He's got Mirko Crow Cop to train everything with. And from Anche Dalia, I mean, the wins, they're very, very impressive. I remember way back in one of the early Fight Night Picks live chats, it might have been an episode of Question Mark Kicks. It was Ollie that asked the question. And I know, Ollie, you're out there and you're asking these questions. Who's like a, a heavyweight that UFC needs to sign? And Anche Dalia was a name that he had said. So I went out, did my research, watched the fights. And the name's difficult to pronounce. From back in 2014, his fight against Arcontis Taxiarchis, and I tried, he had a north-south choke, and it was amazing that he got it in. Now, he was 11-2 at the time, taking on a debuting fighter, but at least to have the wherewithal to sink that choke and to get it done was pretty impressive. He's taken on some names that you've recognized. For Anche Dalia, the losses... Dennis Smoldarev and Marcin Tabor are the last two. And since the Tibora loss, so leg injury, he was out for about three years. Then he takes on Ricardo Prezel over with Ryzen. I was really impressed with that fight. I know Prezel in his time on Contender Series, it was a loss to Dante Mays that we brought up before. But I held Ricardo Prezel in high regard before the fight with Dalia. Then he beats uh, a recognizable name with PFL. It was unfortunate that we didn't get to see more of Dalia with the PFL in that season uh, back in 2019. And then he takes on Ollie Thompson and a bit of a head scratcher. KSW 51, though, in his home country of Croatia. Picks up a huge second round TKO victory there. Now he's taking on Cyril Gaon. Matt, where I'm going to switch this over to you. Both of these guys in most of their fights are the better striker. They're the stronger guy. And they can really, if things go bad on the feet, they can just start to try and grapple and take the other guy down. This is going to be a learning experience for both of these fighters oh, here. Oh, 100% it will be. And I do like the fact that you brought up the Tanner Bozer fight because I think that's the most important fight for Silgon's career. Because when you look at all of his other fights, and yes, he won pretty much every round of that fight, and pretty much every minute, to be completely honest. But in all of his other fights, he never faced much resistance. It was always, okay, Silgon goes out there, he lands big shots, he breaks arms. It's pretty simple. Like he's just he's a huge guy and he's great at everything. But Bozer did test him and he kind of forced to show us what Sirogan's gas tank is. And that was what a lot of people were kind of holding on to hope to that, oh well hopefully Sirogan's really big, he gets tired. Not really. I mean, he's got a fairly good gas tank for the size of him. He's not like Steve Miocic where you can just keep up a crazy high pace for five rounds, but for a guy who's only 6-0 and and 29, uh, really great cardio, phenomenal on the ground, and I do think physical strength has a big part to play in that. And I always go back to when Francis Ngannou was the co-main event to Derek Lewis and Shamil Abdurakimov when he fought your boy Anthony Freight Train Hamilton. And Hamilton got Ngannou up against the cage, and Ngannou just grabbed a Kimura grip and decided, I'm not just going to get my back off the cage with this. What if I just pull on this and see what happens? And he actually got the submission from it, and that was more of a case of, oh, I'm very big and strong, not like, oh, I'm Damian Maia and I've got all these years of experience. But 
Cyril Gaunt kind of falls into that where, and I know it is an easy comparison to make, oh, he's like Francis, they're both French, they're both huge, but I do think Cyril Gaunt's grappling is at a different level than Francis. I do think Francis is the better striker out of the two, but if Gaunt can get you to the ground, it's a terrifying proposition. He can pull on your leg. He's not afraid to go for a knee bar or a heel hook. He can go for arm bars. We haven't really seen a lot of his choke game, but I'm sure, I'm sure it is there. His ground up is phenomenal too, and I do like the way that he's able to kind of adjust himself while in top position, especially the heavyweight division. Again, to bring up Francis Ngannou, uh, when he fought Stipe, like, there's a point, and I think Stipe is a really good grappler, but there's a point where Stipe is basically on his knees just next to Francis hitting him, and you're thinking, well, okay, Francis, there's nothing holding him there. He can just get up, but he doesn't. So, Cyril Gaunt does have good top control, though. He's not an easy guy to buck off of you, of course, due to the size rule. I'm sure that doesn't help, but he is a smart grappler in that uh, capacity. But on the feet, I do think Gaunt, the way that he is kind of able to work behind the jab, he, got, he has such great power. Something I'm a little worried about with Dalia, if he just if he does force himself forward, we haven't seen Gone on the back foot very much, and that's always the first. Well, that's one of the first hurdles that a lot of MMA fighters have to get over. It's what's the first fight where they absorb ten plus leg kicks, and what's the first fight where they are pushed backwards because. Fighters on the retreat are much different. Uh, again, your boy Drinkus Duplessis, and last weekend we saw him in that first round. Kinda, he didn't look like himself. He didn't look like the KSW version. No, no, exactly. <laughs> and he did look nervous. He was getting up against the cage. And you could tell that that pressure from Perez was really getting to him. But then after he sort of, you know, got comfortable and found his way into the fight, he was able to open up. With Cyril gone, I think it could be another uh, case like that where Anche Delia is able to really push him backwards, get him up against the cage, and make gone work, really pose a lot of threats to him. But I just see before the end of the night, Cyril gone, whether it is on the feet or whether it is on the ground, he has an answer to most MMA questions. And unless you're a guy in the top five, unless you are one of those Derek Lewis, uh, uh, Curtis Blades, and Alexander Volkov, I think Cyril Gaunt's going to be able to beat a lot of guys in the top 15 of the heavyweight division. So, I mean, yeah, there's going to be some inherent bias with the pick, but we've been high on Cyril Gaunt since he was a TKO, and he was 3-0 at True. the time. I mean, he had a huge win over Adam Dykes, uh, and now Dykes is trying out boxing because MMA just hasn't been the same since Cyril Gaunt. So, for Gaunt, he's been all that in a bag of chips. He's still Canada, but also over in France as well. So, Anche Delia, again, I mentioned it, from Crow Cop Team, and I haven't heard really any bad things about his game. Again, the small dar of loss that's going to happen. A loss to Marcin Tabora, you're facing UFC-level competition. You faced former UFC and former Bellator guys as well on the way up in the regional scene. Like I said, the Prezel win, that's over a good grappler, and it just continues. So, three-fight win streak, he's looked good in those three fights with major organizations, Ryzen, PFL, and KSW, that's pretty good experience. Yeah. It really is. And I think the topology picks at a 719, 92% with Gon, 66% saying he's going to win by knockout. The odds, Cyril Gon's the biggest uh, favorite on the card. He opened a minus 350. He's now uh, almost a minus 600 um, over on best fight odds. For Delia, opens a plus 285. He's now a plus 423. They're way too skewed, so it, it it's kind of silly. I mean, Anche Delia, what does he do well? He pushes a pace. He strikes pretty good. He keeps his hands low at times, which is a little worrisome, especially against a guy like Gon, who can do it from both stances. You got to watch out That's for that, point. too. Um, Anche Delia has as good of a shot as any of these underdogs on this card. I have to say that. If I woke up tomorrow and Anche Delia knocked out Cyril Gon in the first round, would I be surprised? No. If this fight got it to the ground and Anche Delia reversed position just based off of pure freakish strength be a little and surprised. somehow ended up with a TKO or a submission victory from the top position, I'd be a little more surprised on that one, but I wouldn't be overly surprised. Cyril gone again. I think he has all the upside in the world. We could pick off, you know, the UFC ranked heavyweights at this point, and I could tell you who he would most likely match up well against and beat. And I think there's a lot of guys out there, and I'm not joking. No, I, I, but Anche Delia is actually one of the tougher uh, challenges for him out there. And stylistically, it makes for this to be such a fun fight because this fight is not as one-sided as those odds or those predictions might tell you. No, and it's heavyweight MMA. Like, MMA is the only sport where you can score 20 points in the last second to win the game. Like, if you're down by 10 in basketball, you can't shoot an 11-point shot with a second left. In MMA, you can lose every second of the fight and still win it. Look at Yarzino Rosenstrike against Derek Alistair Lewis, Marcin Tabora. Exactly. Like, it happened. I was going to say Derek, Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis, Alexander Volkov. Volkov. Really, Derek Lewis in all of his fights. But Cyril Gaunt, I, again, until he does fight those Jarzinos, the Overeems, the Derek Lewis, like, the guys have been around for a while at the top of the division. I do think he's going to beat them. Again, heavyweight MMA being a minus 600 favorite, I don't really think it's justified just because anything can happen. But my prediction is going to stay with Cyril Gaunt.
I'm going to go with Gone as well. Again, I like the technique of his striking, the switching of stances. We've seen the takedowns there. We've seen the fact that he can definitely capitalize in some positions where you don't see heavyweights capitalizing. Now, I know Ollie and the rest of you and, uh, you know, the, the fans in Europe, you might be going with, well, either guy, really, because you have France and Croatia. But I can certainly see a split here. I want to know what you're thinking in the comments. I love this fight. One of my guys in Cyril Gone, so it's tough. But we both have Cyril Gone in this one. Super exciting fight. We got a great main event between two really tough outs in T City Brian Ortega and the Korean Zombie Chin Sung Jung. So you're gonna want to keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, Matt. As we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. It's finally time oh for our main event of the evening. We have the return of Brian T City Ortega taking on the Korean Zombie Chan Sung Jung, Matt. This is such a fun fight. I mean, last weekend we had Marlon Moraes and Corey Sandhagen, and that was a fun matchup at Bantamweight. Possible title implications. Well, this one falls along the same lines, and I know we have Brian Ortega coming off of a really long layoff. It's been almost two years since he faced Max Holloway for the belt, and the kid got pieced up, and he took a lot of time away. Now, I remember the narratives. He was going to take time off regardless, but probably not this much time, and it has been some time since we've seen him. Now, on his rise, undefeated at the time, he was the first person to knock out Frankie Edgar. That's a pretty big feather to have in your cap, especially in a fight where Edgar didn't need to take it. Like, he was pretty much guaranteed the title shot, took it on short notice, and uh, yeah, Brian Ortega knocked his head off his block. And for Korean Zombie, he was off for so long due to the mandatory military service. We saw him come back on a loss to Yair Rodriguez in one of the most insane knockouts you're going to see. Greatest fight. Just shy of Joaquin Buckley knocking out Impic Sanganai last weekend, but he gets knocked out in the last second. Then he finishes Hanato Moicano, and he finishes Frank Yeager. Two former common opponents between these guys, and both guys with the same amount of success, but Korean Zombie had a lot more success in his fight against Moicano than you could say Ortega did in his, although he did finish it. Now, this fight overall, so great. It's one of those stylistic matchups that really you got to circle on your calendar because Ortega, you know how good the jiu-jitsu is. For Chan Sung Jung, you know how good his striking is. And you look at his record, I mean, he had that one blip where he lost to Leonard Garcia and he lost to George Roop. But at the time, WEC days, those guys were pretty highly regarded. I know you're going to see George so Roop. 10 years ago, too. Yeah, you're going to go, George Roop, what? Look at the guy's record and look at how he fought his fights. And yeah, he was one of the better guys in the 45er weight class. Now, for the Korean Zombie, did his title shot work? It did not. He broke his arm. He broke his arm against Jose Aldo. But overall, such an exciting fighter. I know these are two of your favorites. Oh, yeah. Let us know what you're thinking about this one. Okay, so I told Craig right before we started this, I'm more excited for this fight than I am for the majority of title fights and pay-per-view main events just because this is pretty much a title fight. If you think about it, like, it's realistic that one of these two guys could be champ within the next couple of years and the other guy could be the challenger. Like, this is how high level this fight is. And for Brian Ortega, we know the jiu-jitsu, it's phenomenal, but the striking's the thing that he has really improved upon because coming into the UFC, if your jiu-jitsu's a 10 out of 10, it's not like that's the focal point that you really have to focus on, whereas his striking kept on getting better. He's got really good elbows too, and he throws them for weird angles we did see that in the holloway fight we'll get to that in a second but he was he throws really nice spinning elbows and whatnot and i think he figured it out brian ortega in the frank edgar fight said that i'm so big at this weight division i've got really long arms that everyone wants to try to close distance on me make it a boxing fight so that's why he's really improved upon his elbows because you're going to come in meet one of those big shots and then it's going to rock you and that's really what happened to frank edgar because Frank Edgar, we know, kind of just the perfect form of a wrestle boxer. We can't wrestle Brian Ortega because he's probably going to choke you out. And that's the crazy thing to me. Frankie Edgar is a phenomenal grappler, like one of the better grapplers really in the lighter weight classes in UFC history. He didn't even want to take Brian Ortega to the ground because he realized what a threat Ortega is just off of his back. So that's the kind of respect that Frankie Edgar had for his grappling. And Ortega knew... And okay, he's probably not going to take me down. Frank Edgar is starting to, you know, get the lead on the volume. He's starting to land his combinations. Ortega lands that one elbow, and that's all she wrote. He proceeds to basically head kick, throw a bunch of hooks, and then take Frank Edgar off his feet with an uppercut. Beautiful performance. Then Max Holloway had those weird weight cutting issues or, or couldn't get cleared in that one time at uh, International Fight Week, so they end up fighting later on in the year. I, I don't really know how to say this because I have the utmost respect for Brian Ortega, especially after that fight. He got beat so badly in that fight. He got and bullied. He did. And there is moments where Brian Ortega does have some success. He goes for some nice takedowns. He lands some good shots of his own. 
But Max Holloway, in the fourth round alone, landed 160 strikes on Brian Ortega. The worst part about it, if you're a big Ortega fan, was where he was beaten so bad that Max Holloway was just toying with his hand placement. Picking him up, moving it, seeing if he's still in it, having fun. Yeah, no, yes, Max Holloway is one of the best strikers in UFC history. Don't think that's a controversial thing to say. But the Korean Zombie is not really that same kind of striker. So if you are a Brian Ortega fan, I wouldn't worry about the sheer volume that Zombie is going to bring. What I'd worry about is the counter shots. Because Ortega is a guy, like he got dropped by Clay Guida at UFC 199 in the first round. Where Clay Guida throws like this kind of overhand left. It just kind of taps him. Just shocks him for a second. And he gets right back up. But those are kind of worrying. And I do think Brian Ortega has a phenomenal chin. But if you can get stunned by a guy like Clay Guida early on in a fight, if you can lose, you know, the early rounds to a guy like Hanato Moikano, who I do think is a phenomenal fighter, but you're losing early rounds against them, you're losing to Tiago Tavares and then coming back, it's a lot of slow starts for Brian Ortega. Chan Sung Jung does not get off to slow starts. He really only knocks people out in the first round. But the cool thing about his style, though, is that he can keep it going and his power lasts until late into the fifth. Now, we've talked about slow starters before where it was always an issue in their game plan and maybe they're no longer in the OC. I can think of one slow starter that was consistently slow and then all of a sudden has rounded a corner in Marlon Vera. So maybe Brian Ortega in this time off has taken a Marlon Vera type approach to guys that train in Southern California to his game where now Ortega realizes, hey... If I'm fighting the Korean zombie, we know he's a fast starter. I've got to get out there and either try and take this to the mat or at least get it into a clinch position where I can threaten with my submissions, but also throw some of those close shots in tight. So for me, Brian Ortega, there's a huge upside. We saw him. I mean, undefeated, former RFA champ coming into the UFC, picking up win after win. And then all of a sudden, I mean... You're taking on Max Holloway. Unless you're Alexander Volkanovsky or Conor McGregor, it's tough to look pretty good. But against... even Volkanovsky, like, those guys are pretty much just fighting to draws every fight. So it's tough to look great against Max Holloway. Uh, Max Holloway looked pretty good in that Ortega fight. Now, for the Korean Zombie in his last two, because it's tough to take a lot of stock into his fight against Dennis Bermudez, I mean, almost four years ago. Jose Aldo was seven years ago. Moicano forced him into lightweight. Frankie Edgar... Forced him into Bantamweight. Now, again, the Edgar fight was kind of like a layup where he was already... Edgar was already getting ready for Bantamweight. They needed somebody to come in on short notice because this was originally supposed to be Brian Ortega, Korean Zombie. Edgar obliges because he's a company man and one of the greatest lightweights ever. And, yeah, lost the fight. And it was predictable at that time. It was almost like the time that Michael Bisping said, you know what? I'll fight Kelvin Gastelum. Sure. Didn't work out for him. But in this one, Korean Zombie pretty good uh grappler is he's he's underrated here's my question who does henner gracie corner in this oh henner gracie's gonna corner brian ortega but it is interesting because he does have a relationship with chan sung jung again telling craig before this episode early big brown breakdown henner gracie speaks really highly of chan sung jung speaks about going to south korea training with him how nice he was and just you know the overall experience so it will be kind of interesting i don't think that's going to play a huge part into this fight but i do think the important thing to focus on is that jay park yes jay park (laughs) No, Chan Sung Jung's grappling isn't at such a deficit from Brian Ortega's to where the second this fight hits the ground, I'm worried for Chan Sung Jung. Because you got to think, the Korean zombie, he submitted Dustin Poirier with a Darce choke, submitted Lennon Garcia with a twister. Like, most of the time when guys have submissions on their record, it's like guillotine, armbar, kimura, rear naked choke. Chan Sung Jung decided, nah, that's cool and all. I'm going to get Darce chokes and twisters instead because those are, like, the way more fun kinds of submissions to get. And... His chin is phenomenal. And both these guys' chins are phenomenal. And that's really why this is going to be your fight of the night. And I'm really going to stop picking main events to be fight of the night. Because it's not original in the least bit. But I think for a fight like this, it's justifiable. The Korean Zombies boxing is going to be the big point in this fight. Again, with how Moikano and how he's able to time just the movements of Moikano and counter off of that. I think it's going to give Brian Ortega a lot of problems. Now... Brian Ortega, again, if he can get the fight to the mat, the submissions are always going to be a threat. And I'm not saying that Brian Ortega is just like an average black belt of jiu-jitsu. Like, Brian Ortega is almost an adopted Gracie at this point. And his black belt, we've seen it. Like, the Cub Swanson guillotine, one of the nicest submissions you'll ever see, where he basically pulled his guard, but Cub Swanson's holding him up still. And he has him in a guillotine, lets go, readjust in the air, and then still is able to get the submission. The time off is another thing that really worries me about Brian Ortega. And something that the commentary every now and then we'll talk about it, depending on who is on the desk. After you have fights like that and you take that much damage, we don't really know what version of you we're going to get. Now, I pray and I hope that we get the best version of Brian Ortega because that's really the best thing for the sport. 
But is the Korean zombie really the guy who you want to test that against in a five-round main event, coming off a fight where you had a broken orbital, a broken nose, and a broken hand? Stylistically, I just think it's a bad matchup for Brian Ortega because he has to get a guy who has really good takedown defense to the ground to win. If you really want to get to brass tacks and you look at the overall numbers, and we have a big enough sample size from both of these guys, one guy it's over a longer period of time in the Korean zombie, but still... The Korean Zombie beats Brian Ortega in just about every statistical category that you can track over on UFC stats. I mean, for Brian Ortega, the really worrisome number is the strikes landed per minute to absorb per minute. It's 4.07 wow. given to 7.36 taken. Now, I know that's skewed a lot by, I mean, the Moicano fight, he took some damage, but especially the fight against Max Holloway. So, skewed a little bit. Um, in terms of his takedown accuracy, 16%. But again, we said he can threaten in the clinch, and that's probably where you're going to want to see him do a lot of work if you're big in the corner of Ortega. The takedown defense for the Korean Zombie, 77%. That's something that you got to like. Again, last five fights, Korean Zombie, the long layoffs. Um, but then again, the loss to, or, or to Rodriguez, it's going to happen. The last two wins are huge. Over on top, all due to the total votes, 821 so far, 76 for the percent for the korean zombie 78 percent predicting a knockout win for him in terms of the odds they're close i mean zombie open minus 210 some money came down on tkz then it went up on ortega now the korean zombie sits in a minus 185 favorite for ortega open plus 180 he's now a plus 155 underdog so there's definitely a path to victory for both guys i just have to side with the korean zombie in this one i mean I love the boxing. I love his clinch work as well. That's something that I and didn't focus on a lot. And the power, Ungodly. the fact that his defensive grappling abilities are certainly there. The offense is there. For Brian Ortega, the layoff, I get to scratch my head. Now, I did go with Thomas Almeida. That's probably my biggest hipster pick going with uh, somebody coming off a long layoff and he's been finished. But for Brian Ortega, yeah, I don't know what we're going to get. Now, if Ortega comes out here looking like a world beater, would I be happy? You're darn tootin' I would be. That'd be great. But overall, I have to side with the Korean Zombie in this fight. I want to see a title fight between Volkanovski and, and Jung. That'd be awesome. So, yeah. Does that play a factor in the pick? No. But... I'm going with Korean Zombie here, man. So, uh, I'll start with this. I do think this should be a title eliminator, at least for the Korean Zombie. If Ortega wins, I'd like to see maybe one more win against, like, a Calvin Cater. Maybe a Josh Abbott just kind of depends on how much time he wants off. But that's a fight that I'd like to see going down. Just It's hard to give Brian Ortega another title fight. And I know the champ is different, but it's hard to give him a title fight going. Well, in his last one, he got beat, like, really, really bad. Whereas the Korean Zombie, if he wins this, it's just going to stack onto a few more wins that he already has. All within the top five as well, which I think is really important because Moicano at the time was number five for Jung I do think the power in the boxing are going to cause Ortega a lot of problems because if Ortega was more of a traditional wrestler I, I would favor him in this fight if he could go out there and just give me that double leg no matter what if he gets rocked and could go out there and just panic wrestle I, I would give him the edge maybe and even then I don't know if I would just the power the combos the technique of Chan Sung Jung something that doesn't get talked about enough everyone talks about oh he's the zombie he moves forward he can take a lot of damage he can dish it out as well really smart fighter too I think after that Yair fight he took kind of the Justin Gaethje switch where Gaethje was like okay I'm really powerful and I can go hit for hit with these guys but what if I just use my technique instead and didn't rely on my chin so now Chan Sung Jung goes okay well I can take a tremendous shot but now I'm just not eating them for no reason. So I, I just think the smarter, cerebral version of the Korean Zombie is going to be able to get this done. But again, I cannot stress how excited I am for this main event. Matt, really looking forward to it. Both of us going with the Korean Zombie, Chan Sung Jung, to pick up the win. If you missed the rest of the predictions on the card, make sure you check them out in the playlist. We really appreciate everybody tuning in week over week. Oh, yeah. Be sure that you check out Question Mark Kicks at the end of the week where we both get a chance to spend an entire week doing even more tape study, but factoring in the weigh-ins and just the happenings of the week so make sure you check that out on saturdays subscribe to the channel toss us a like i hate to ask for it but please do it and matt keep it locked in with fighting picks and as we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it.